www.thefinancialguru.com and download your free phone app today. The Inner Voice Show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice. A heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and I have Sean in studio. This is a show about what matters most in life our minds, our thoughts, our feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. In this show, I'll bring you the latest research about even mild long-term depressive symptoms among mothers are connected with emotional problems among small children, such as hyperactivity, aggressiveness, and anxiety. Then I'll speak to Dr. Fereshte Amin. She's an adjunct professor at Cal Poly in Pomona, and she's the author of Success Strategies of American Leaders. You can call us on the studio line if you'd like to speak to me or Dr. Amin, 951-922-3532. We're going to talk about success and happiness today. Be sure to listen to my podcast on iTunes and Stitcher and share with your friends and email me or call me and let me know what you're interested in so I can bring those conversations back to you. We'll be right back with the tip of the week. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time-limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the Awareness Integration Model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. Well, here is tip of the week. And I'm sorry, my voice is a bit hoarse. I've been coming down with uh, a cold, I guess. Um... I've been working on shifting sadness into happiness and gratitude this week. I've worked on my own sadness, shifting it at times where I kind of was down, especially since I was sick, I was a little, you know, it affected my mood. And I think most people, it affects their mood. But I also, with my clients, I was working in looking at how we could shift ourselves because stuff is going to happen all day where it could take your mood into a space of sadness or anger. But if we could have some control over it and shift it, what would it look like? There are many events that happen in our lives or we hear news on the internet or on TV that makes us sad, scared, or agitated. How do you turn into this kind of a mood into a state of happiness? I've noticed that filling yourself up First, with feeling of gratitude and love is the key to shift the state of being to the state of happiness. So as long as we keep looking at outside, looking at what's going out there um, and putting it in a space of looking at negativity constantly, obviously we're going to get sad and scared. And it's not that those emotions are not valid for their own purposes. But the point is that the emotions are there in order for to give us some notion of this isn't working or something's going on that doesn't work for me or I don't want to be a part of it. So I just want to push myself away Um, and I want to get the message, but come back to a state of content and happiness. How do you shift and create that for yourself and bring your feel yourself with love first? So, and the only f- way to do it is first start with you. There's no way of shifting the outside world. Is first start with you. So begin with appreciating yourself first. Maybe start looking at the mirror, looking at um, your body, 
including all the parts that you like. And, um, and even you can even claim the ones that you don't like and say, okay, I got it, that you're there. You're definitely useful. Uh, even though it might, I might not like the shape of my nose or whatever it is in my body that I don't like, at least appreciate what it's used for. It's used for breathing well when I don't have my cold. Um, so it's more first appreciating yourself. You look at your face, you look at your body, you look at, you know, appreciating your hands for all that it does, appreciating your leg for moving you around. And I guess with our body, a lot of times we just take it for granted unless for one day we get sick or one part of our fingers or legs or don't work. And then we really, really appreciate the one that we just lost, right? So what if we start appreciating our body from top to bottom, the beauty that it has, the functionality that it has, all the way that it really supports us and helps us move and moving forward. Then appreciate your belongings and achievements, things you already have, things that you look around your home, things that you are capable of getting, you know, maybe your car, maybe your job, maybe money, maybe things that you clothe, your, all of those. Um, things that you have achieved in your life, the cap capacity, capabilities, and um, everything that you can do, all your knowledge, those are yours. And have some gratitude for it. You know, pat yourself on the back a little bit. Appreciate all the people who are around you and that they're giving you love, care, and service. You know, we can't do anything on our own. We are so connected to each other that every single level that we're here together and connecting is because so many people are working hard um, to bring us this. Um, and I appreciate you, Sean, for working so hard all the time to create this space for us and, and you guys. So you look at everybody that is around you who creates the essence of what brings you comfort all day. Appreciate all the people who are around you now, but were and are the source of your strength and your accomplishments. Um, and even appreciate the people who are not here with you now, but they were source of appreciative source of uh, your growth. You know, maybe your parents, if they're no longer with you, they're the one who brought you into this world. Maybe there were teachers who. Uh, supported you and taught you a lot of things. Maybe there was a neighbor, or maybe there was a, a somebody, a friend that held your hand and pulled you to another, you know, a, a step above, which you wouldn't be here if it wasn't really about them. So fill yourself with love and gratitude and then share yourself from that place, from the place of gratitude so that you could bring this source to others. And the return is spectacular, I'll promise you. And it will really, really serve you well. So love yourself and others now. Don't wait, just now, because you certainly deserve it. We'll be right back with the latest research. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. PM Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM dot com. Here's the latest research. According to recent research from National Institute of Health and Welfare, even mild long term depressive symptoms among mothers are connected with emotional problems among small children, such as hyperactivity, aggressiveness, and anxiety. The study investigated how the depressive symptoms of both parents affected the child by the age of two and five. The father's depressive symptoms affected the, the child's emotional problems only if the mother was also depressed. The mother's symptoms, however, affected the child if, if, even if the father was not depressed. 
Moderate depressive symptoms can be observed in over 20% of parents. Most serious symptoms are seen less than about 9% of mothers and 2.5% of fathers. So depression among parents both during and after pregnancy not only affects the person suffering from the depression, but also has a long-term impact on the well-being of the newborn child. Even in cases of mild depression, it is important that the symptoms are identified and the parents are offered support as early as possible, if necessary, already during the pregnancy. In families, depression experienced by the mother has a key impact on the child's well-being. Um, the maternity clinic system functions well, but attention should be paid to depressive symptoms among mothers over a long-term period also from the pregnancy throughout the end of the child's first year of age. One parent's depression also puts the other parent at risk. The depression of one parent is a factor that can put the other parent at risk of depression as well. In addition, depressive symptoms among mothers and fathers are quite long term. They can start already during pregnancy and continue past the child's first birthday. It's important to monitor the mental well-being of both parents during pregnancy and after the birth of a child. And if one parent depression, then the symptoms of the other parent should also be examined. Currently, however, father's psychological well-being is not necessarily covered by the questionnaires on maternity clinics. Prior depression is also the most significant risk factors. Long-term depression is an indication that the depression may have been experienced already before the pregnancy. Previous experience of depression was the fact, is also in fact one of the key risk factors for moderate or severe depressive symptoms. Other significant risk factors include sleep deprivation, definitely during pregnancy um, and beginning of the newborn's life, stress, anxiety, and a bad family environment. There's a lot of fights that happens right into pregnancy time in bad marriages or, you know, marriages at risk, and especially when the child comes at, and um, when both parents are really at, um, stressed, they get into a lot of fights. These most prominent risk factors were predictors of depression among both mothers and fathers. The good thing is that depression um, is uh, treatable. So if you notice that you have depression, especially whether you're pregnant or not, but then you're having a child, you need to go get help. There's a lot of help, there's different types of methods. There's medical management, psychotherapy, talk therapy, you know, cognitive behavioral, and the method that I created, awareness integration model that we've done a lot of research in universities. Our latest research was in Long Beach, uh, Cal State Long Beach, which just with my book, Life Reset, and not even doing therapy, we brought down depression about 63%. Uh, we've went in therapy when we've done the studies, we've brought down the depression to 75%. That is a huge, huge, huge impact and, and an you know, amazing number that is, has worked. So depression is something that is treatable. No one needs to stay in their own depression. And especially if you are pregnant or you have postpartum depression, you need to get help because you definitely are not only affecting yourself, but it's affecting the whole essence of uh, the child's um, life and the environment of your family. And you don't deserve to be depressed. You deserve to be happy and you deserve to create an amazing family uh, which are all happy. So get help if it, for any reason you know that you are depressed, even if you don't call it depression, if you're down most of the days, most of the hours of the day, and because there's situational things and you're like, well, I know what I'm upset about. Yes, yes, you know what you're upset about, but there's always another way of thinking and looking and outlook and, and dealing with things, which the same thing that you are suffering so much around can become such an ease and you can just let it go. And I think that's what you need to do and you deserve to do that for yourself and everyone around you. So now um, I want to tell you about our guest. We're going to be talking to Dr. Fereshte Amin. She's an adjunct uh, professor of management and leadership in College of Business Administration, California State Polytechnic University in Pomona. Fereshte is active in seminars and workshops in Amin Leadership Center of Los Angeles. In the capacity, she helps individuals achieve greater success in life and in business. 
Our workshops and seminars and coaching practices are based on scientific research, exposing the five common success factors exhibited by leaders who have successfully navigated the challenges of assimilation and multiculturalism. Dr. Amin has worked with individuals and organizations from around the world in both Iran and the U.S., and her book, Successive Strategies of Iranian American Leaders, is currently in circulation in both countries. She's um, consulted managers on leadership and interviewed some of the most prominent business leaders in the U.S. to determine their secret of success. So we're going to talk about success and happiness. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Dr. Fereshte Ami. Dr. Fujan, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time-limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the awareness integration model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. Dr. Fujan Zain is a psychotherapist, a marriage and family therapist, and a life coach with more than 27 years of experience. She is the author of the Awareness Integration Model, which has been researched and published in numerous international journals. Dr. Fujan has offices in Beverly Hills, Irvine, and Woodland Hills, California, and also consults online and by telephone. Make an appointment with her today by calling 818-648-2140 or go online to www.fujan.com. That's www.fujan.com. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk, KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Inner Voice. I'm Dr. Fujan Zain, and I'm so excited to have Dr. Fereshte Amin. She's an adjunct professor of management and leadership in College of Business Administration in Cal Poly. Welcome to my show, Dr. Amin. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. I always get excited when I talk about this favorite topic. So it's an opportunity for me to uh, go back and review happiness and success because that's my favorite. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> of course. So excited. Uh, it's wonderful to have you. And I know that uh, we've ha I've had you on my show before. And what are the most important factors? And I know that everybody wants to succeed. Like there's no one that you talk to and they're like, no, I actually prefer to fail. Everyone is geared up towards success. Now, I get it that everyone's um, concept of success is very different. And some of, you know, some of us get the concept of success from our parents. Some of us get it from the society. Uh, but each one of us creates a particular meaning for ourselves in a way that we assign a uh, concept of success for ourselves. And I think there's also this assumption that success brings happiness. You know, it's like they're synonymous together as if, if the only way that you create happiness for yourself, if you've achieved uh, success or even if you wasn't part of the achievement, 
at least you felt like success, even if you didn't have a tangible concept of, oh, if I achieve this and that, then it, that I would call myself, you know, successful and I'll be happy. Uh, it would be then contentment with who I am as, as the concept of, you know, happiness. And I know that you also teach this and you wrote a book about it. So what first, what is it, how is it that you got even interested in the area of leadership, success, and happiness? And then let's go into the, you know, defining those terms. Hmm. Oh, uh, it, it really takes a long time, uh, you know, hour to discuss that. But it's interesting that when I reviewed actually this morning for my talk, I realized, you know, from even age of five, six, uh, I wanted to make my parents happy. That, it, you know, it came, it, that was a flashback. Even if I had something really I like to eat, I wanted to give it to my mom. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, and because I really wanted to see her face happy. And so that's kind of my background. And now I feel it, it, it is like my purpose. Uh, and uh, then when I started my doctorate in uh, Pepperdine University on organizational leadership, in orientation, like a two days orientation, um, there was a professor, Dr. Vance Caesar. He, at the beginning, he talked about, uh, you know, happiness and success. And he said, you know, high achievers, he, he did research on high achievers, the people who achieve so many things. And uh, so he read, uh, his discussion was that, you know, they are 92% of them after they achieve what they wanted, they worked so hard to achieve, they don't feel happy anymore. Oh. So, and then only 92%, uh, that's huge number, almost everybody, everybody is not happy when they achieve. And then... So it's like, what's the point? You try so hard to create something of success and then you achieve it and you're like, ah, okay, yeah, so what's next? So exactly. And you know, as a doctoral student, it was really kind of immediately I got interested in topic. Okay, what were the qualities uh, of those 8% that they are happy? So this became the kind of my uh, area of interest. And also I started when I was at Pepperdine, like for four years, I was his teaching assistant, his grad graduate assistant. He was following him everywhere he went. So, and he has written a book on High Achievers, uh, Guide to uh, Happiness. So he's, uh, that's because we have a short period. I thought maybe as a background, with a general uh, research, I will talk about that. And then if we have time, another, you know, session, I will talk about my own, which is like, you know, I use different population. Right. And uh, so... He said that, you know, high achievers, usually they have uh, those like 92%. They have the quality, they have uh, high drive, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, uh, he mentioned at age of two, even you can realize which child has high drive. It's because of uh, excitement or fear. So they are more engaged in life. So first is high drive. Second is high self-confidence. It means that, you know, if somebody has achieved something, I can do it or I can learn to do it. And the third one is sen uh, uh, sense of self-responsibility. That yes, that works. Or locus of control, that you, that's your word I'm using. Um, psychological works, uh, the words that uh, uh, self, uh, they feel responsible for their own um, life and the four factor that none of them and we, we are not aware of them that you know we follow them for success they they have low self-esteem oh yeah those 92 percent they achieve and what's the quality of low self-esteem that you know at the end they don't feel good about themselves they always compare themselves to some oh i should get that kind of success after uh, achieving the and the the language they use always they say oh okay i have to get another degree to be happy i have to get a bigger house to be happy after they achieve it's never ending you know achievement that's why they are high achiever and so one of the concepts that i'm hearing from you is that if the um if the, the reason for achievement is to get validation from others, then 
obviously, whether it's the validation is from our parents or the society or whatever it is that we need that validation from, it seems like no matter what we achieve, there's always going to be somebody better than us, somebody higher with a higher degree, somebody is holding something that we need to actually move forward. So whatever we did, it was only good enough until we received it. And then we'll look at what's again, not good enough and who has better. So I want to go higher than that and then be a, more of an achiever. And that's what I'm hearing from you exactly. that calls it the low self-esteem. But if someone is a self response, has the essence of self responsibility and high drive, and they do it for the challenges that it makes them happy, or it's their experience, then they enjoy the experience that they have. But if the experience is only to get validation from the external world, then it's going to be a kind of empty after they get there. Exactly, exactly. Thanks for clearing that. Exactly. That's the point. You know, that's why, uh, you know, self confidence is like, you know, it's from outside condition. Oh, I yes. can see that self-esteem is from internal, you know, I feel good about myself, regardless of I have achieved or not, as you mentioned that, you know, I do it for the experience, because that's my essence, that's my, you know, purpose. So that's, uh, that's the uh, difference. That's now we will talk about, you know, those 8% that they uh, they are high achievers. At the same time, they are high achievers. We are talking about high achievers, the people who achieve a lot, which, you know, is synonymous to successful people. That's kind of, I want to clarify. So what's the definition of success? To get what I want. Mm -hmm. What's the definition of happiness? I love what I achieve. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the kind of overlap of success and happiness and then okay those eight percent who have uh, you know achieved and they like it so, or happy high achievers they uh, they have a clear purpose that's really kind of uh, they know uh, you know their why why I'm I want to achieve that for example when I remember I was you know I started my doctorate when I had three children and mm -hmm. I had Two girls, like you, I'm a late achiever. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but uh, during that, you have get doctored, you know how, when you're going through dissertation, comp exam, I was so kind of stressed. But I wanted, I said, why am I doing this? But then I remember I was in a conference, Marshall Goldsmith, the famous executive coach was there. I kind of won one of his books. And when he wanted to sign it for me, he said, okay, what's your name? I said, Fereshte. And he said, okay, Fereshte, do you have girls, daughters? I said, yes. Okay, what do you want for your daughters? I said, oh, I really want them to be happy. And he said, Fereshte, be happy, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> so that when I wanted, for example, during my doctor, I was I wanted to quit. I that reminded me. Oh, if I, you know, stop because something that I love, and okay, my daughters would do that. So that mm -hmm. became my purpose. Uh, if I, you know, fulfill my potential, if I, you know, achieve it, my daughters would be do that. So this is kind of a purpose at its, its stage of our life. Even, you know, in the business, I teach business and leadership, even the um, cover of the Fortune uh, magazine uh, this month is about talking the purpose of, in, in a big companies, they're talking about the purpose. And companies who have clear purpose, clear mission, they attract more um, clients, more customers. Well, so, I mean, if we even talk about uh, driving, I mean, obviously, if you know where you're going and what the purpose of going there, then it makes the, the drive and all that happens a bit worth it. So a lot of the if we're just putting ourselves out there and working for the sake of whatever it is. Uh, well, I mean, sometimes we do we, we work because of certain sense of survival and maybe the sort of sense of survival by itself is a purpose. Uh, maybe at one point we need to be done with that and then move on to another essence of purpose, which goes beyond survival and it goes into some sorts of an evolutionary concept. For example, people have children 
And that becomes part of the evolution that, you know, we need families, we need to have children and raise them. And so that becomes part of the success and it has a different purpose. Maybe, for example, for you, you shifted from the evolutionary concept of having children and now it was what about me? Who am I and what do I need to do? And it was shifting from that to, um, okay, now let me go and find what I love. And I remember just before the show, uh, Sean and I were talking about, well, after, you know, you have done your survival bit and say, okay, I have worked in order to survive and do all of that. And then what if I want to reinvent myself? What if everything that I've done, I'm done, like been there, done that, got videos, you know, I'm done with what I've done. I've learned all that I can learn. And what if I want to reinvent myself in another setting, you know, um, who would I be? Um, and I remember like when I was growing up, I, I, I mean, because of what you just said about I had to fulfill my mother's ro role and what she wanted to me, and I didn't really want it. So I was all over the place. I went and had businesses. I didn't want to be in the corporate world and all of that. And then finally, at age 30, it was more like, okay, I want to become a therapist. And I started going back into you know, uh, universities and getting my doctorate and, you know, becoming a therapist. So these, so the kind of a life purpose, it can also shift from one phase to the next to the next. And it can be that when we're, when we choose our purpose, and I know sometimes Dr. I mean, it's, it's as if, you know, some people where the spiritual world, they feel like, you know, we, our soul comes with a purpose. Um, and they're trying all day long to find what that purpose is. Um, and sometimes we lose who we are here and practicality on earth to look at, well, we can choose a purpose anytime. We don't have to keep looking at, you know, what is there for us to, to do. Although as I was sharing it also with Sean is sometimes we can look at what we're really natural at and what, who we are as a natural person with our qualities of our character, you know, the best of who we are can just flourish when we put it in a scenario or in a, in a place where it gives it light and makes it flourish. And the purpose could be also just living our best and, and giving the gift that is unique to us, you know, to the rest of the people. What do you think? Yeah, exactly. I think the purpose is, is something that, you know, at this moment, my purpose is like really contributing. It's, that's the only purpose that right now I have with you. Yeah, each purpose, uh, different, thanks for clearing up that at each step of our life, each stage, uh, we have different purposes. You know, it changes. For example, Bill Gates, he is, when he started Microsoft, his purpose was oh, every person should have a um, computer in their house. But when he, in 2006, when he stepped down from Microsoft, because he, his purpose was changing. He started uh, Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation. So that's, that's the beauty of purpose. It's that each stage, you know, we review. So when I uh, explained the whole, uh, you know, seven uh, characteristics of high achievers, it's, it's a loop, you know, that as, as you mentioned, uh, reviewing, reinventing ourselves. Exactly. I think that's, uh, you know, that's why the second part, uh, second factor after purpose is vision. Having at this stage a clear purpose, uh, a clear vision where I'm going. If if I I'm a family oriented, so I have a vision of like when I'm an 80, I'm gonna have a like birthday party. My grandchildren are around me, even though I'm working. Or the third part is that of the people who have like really clear vision and clear purpose, they are they're so present. They're attractive. And the third factor after that is meaningful work. You know, I have a job or a work that gets me to my purpose and vision. The meaningful work is really uh, the essence of, uh, I think, what you are doing. It's, or I'm, I'm doing, you know, I, I, I live in LA, I drive to Pomona, but really when I go, I'm with my students, I, I'm really, it's, it, it fulfills me. Mm -hmm. I feel I haven't, uh, you know, I'm contributing. So that's kind of a meaningful. The, the four factor is we, we can come back, but I want to include because we may not have time to finish it to 
go all on seven, then we can, you know, talk more detail in the each factors. So after meaningful work is the, you know, having meaningful relationships or energizing relationships. That's really, really important. Uh, you know, we have relationships that gives us energy. And a secret, uh, I know you are a, a therapist and you are a master of, you know, relationships that, so the relation in relationships, in our relationships, uh, either at work or in family with our significant other, with children. So we have to feel that, you know, I have to feel that I'm getting more than I give. Each, each part should have, have that feeling. If one of them feels, oh, I'm doing all the work and he or she doesn't do, that's not sustainable. So if, I, uh, so if we don't feel that, we have to either we are talking about the work. If uh, I should change my job, if I I feel oh this job I'm doing all the work and they don't need pay me enough, either I should change my job or change my attitude to that job. As you mentioned, the, uh, you know the survival. It really is paying my bills. Yeah, I should appreciate it. It's it's it fulfills my purpose. But if I it pays my bill, but I'm always complaining that it's you know, uh, I'm doing all the work. This is not a healthy relationship. So that's why it's a huge another topic about the compensation. Money is just one part of the compensation. Yeah. There's six other factors that contribute to that. And then uh, after relationships and people, what they expect in relationship, that's really interesting that, you know, um, people want to be listened to, to be understood, to be validated, to feel empathy. That's how, that's the secret of feeling uh, yeah, that yeah, uh, that relationship is you're getting more than you give. And the um, fifth factor is beliefs and behaviors that give us peace in the in uncertainty, in the situation, the chaotic situation. You all go through that. So that's uh, that's very important that we have to check our beliefs and behaviors. Yeah, and those are the, the strengths that we have that we could um, hang in there for our resiliency. Like it's a bag of tools where we could push and say, okay, I can, I can survive this. I can handle this. And, you know, go back to our, what we know already in order to push us through. Yes, exactly. So that's the and then uh, the sixth uh, element is uh, uh, people, th those uh, people who are happy, high achievers, they continuously reviewing themselves, uh, renewing and recommitting, uh, reviewing their purpose, their vision, their meaningful work, is if their uh, even their relationships, their beliefs and behaviors. So that's why the importance they, you know, those people, they go like once a year for a week to a retreat to totally review themselves. And the example that I gave about Bill Gates, probably I could be the example. Maybe he has been there and said, oh, yeah, I'm done. Now should I, you know, what's my purpose at this stage of my life? So they review their purpose. As you mentioned, the purpose at this each stage changes. For me, for example, where my kids were small, my purpose was really, you know, feeding them, being a, you know, caring mother to protect them. But when I was like getting my doctorate, I wanted to be a role model. My purpose was being a happy, successful mother for them. So they realized life is beautiful. You can achieve what you want. And uh, so that's reviewing their uh, when they review, they review their beliefs. If, if the one belief is with, is life beautiful? Is world full of opportunities, or life is dangerous? This is these are the beliefs that they have to review. Also, I think that it's so much uh, more important to be aware of ourselves, of our thoughts and emotions, and what we do, because sometimes people keep going after achievements without living truly the achievement and knowing coming back and repurposing themselves, they fall themselves find themselves into 
uh, a routine concept of at one point they made a decision, they had a vision, you know, they found the purpose and then they put themselves in it. And even though their time is passed, their purpose is different, their age is different and their need and desire are different. They have found themselves in this path that they're going, they're getting unhappy, but because they've invested so much time onto a field, whether they studied it or they created businesses out of it or created network out of it, that they have no idea how to move away or, you know, they think that, oh my God, I got to shatter everything and start fresh and I can't. But this concept that you're talking about of reviewing and noticing, am I the same person who made the, the same decision about what my purpose should be when I was, was at age 20? Maybe my needs today are so different that it just doesn't work. You know, I've worked with a lot of professionals, you know, dentists and pharmacists and, you know, physicians, attorneys that they've done so much investment on, you know, their careers, they've paid so much money and spent so many hours of, you know, doing their work until they became successful. And then, at you know, after like the 10 year mark or 20 year mark, I'm like, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. But the investment that they've put in there, they feel bad about, oh, I'm just going to say, oh, well, I don't want to do this anymore. But so what happens to all the investment? And yet they may make makes themselves miserable by insisting to carry on something that they decided 20 years ago yeah. while, while they're so different and they're completely different human being. Yeah, exactly. And that's why there, you hear so many like TED Talks <laughs> that, you know, oh, I was like that successful that and then he left or she left everything and went to a um, ashram in India. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You know, they don't review every year themselves. They don't renew, they don't recommit. And that we, in decision making, we call it overcommitment. So commitment is good, but overcommitment is exactly what you are you know, pointing out. That that's why, you know, it's really pause, you know, review, reflect, and make adjustment that, you know, who is not judging, you know, I'm responsible for my life or, but, but some people, Maybe at late ages, they become like, they have victim mentality that, you know, oh, I have spent that money and this is, the, they start blaming the society, the system, everything that ends up, um, you know, I have to work so hard, pay insurance, malpractice, whatever you're pointing at, because they miss the point of, you know, we all have to review, um, renew and recommit and gradual you know, adjustment, like, you know, for if you go to the forest, you know, I just came back from, you know, Santa Cruz, which is like Redwood Forest. And when I was driving to the airport, I would see, oh, my God, the tall trees, you know, they are leaning to search sun. Mm -hmm. That's that's our nature. Mm -hmm. But if we don't adjust and there is, we die, like like trees die. So that's very, very important to, you know, really set the time for uh, to review ourselves. What's my purpose at this stage of life? So that's it needs. And the last seven point uh, factor is discipline. You know, I have to put in my calendar. So for uh, that, you know, it's a discipline that I have to, for example, every, every year or right now, really, the, because of the pace of the fast, uh, you know, environment, everything. Maybe even uh, some people, they really, every season, they go to a retreat mm -hmm. to really review because it's fast change. So so then I have, I have to have a discipline to put that. I have to have a discipline uh, for to take care of my body, to take care of my beliefs and uh, spending time for myself to whatever is important for me. If we don't have Discipline, that's a famous word from uh, Scott Peck, The Road Less Travel. He mentioned without discipline, you can't achieve anything. With some, with some discipline, you can achieve something, but with total discipline, you can achieve anything you want. That's really, it has been, you know, emphasized in all ancient 
traditions, the importance of uh, discipline. And I also have noticed, uh, Dr. Amin, that people who, and I work with people who, like we talked about, they've invested a lot on some career or uh, that they have to work at a location for a uh, survival base. Uh, and they're done with this. But then if they don't feel success, I've also watched people to create what they need from the purpose of the meaningful work and something that is their you know, passion and they can do with relationships in a different area. First begin as a hobby and you know, get themselves into it and really get good at it. And then from there, maybe try to look at that maybe as a career possibility or even if it's not a career possibility, they might still feel as a success if they do something, which to them means, uh, you know, if it's fulfilling, you know, a lot of people who are philanthropists, they're not necessarily doing anything themselves, which are the success people, the people who go, you know, to, uh, give their time as a volunteer to another group. So success does not necessarily have to be attached only to career and money. It can be, it, you could get your career and money from another perspective and, you know, still feel success in such an other realm. It's beautiful to bring those, bring these two together at one point. But if we can't start off from that space, maybe we could have it split off and then join. What do you think about that? Uh, I think, uh, as we, you know, define the success, it's, it's being clear what I want, what makes me happy. Who defines success for me? As you mentioned, for example, you know, uh, that's that's uh, I have to define success to get what I want, what I decide I want. I remember I had an MBA when uh, I started having uh, I got my MBA from Iran. Then when I came here, everyone say, "Oh, get an MBA here. It's if you want to, if you get your doctorate, you don't make much money. Go work either work with your MBA here, or you can get an another MBA from top universities." because it's, you become more successful. But I really, to me, it was because I'm a learner. I'm, you know, that's what I love to learn and share my learning. So who defines, you know, my success? success? Yeah. So then I chose my, my journey because I was so clear that, you know, that's, that's, that's who I am. Yes. And then gradually, after you know exploring, I realized, oh, this is what if I if I'm also you know entrepreneurial from very practical. If I study doctor, I want to use it. I want to be practical. If I I don't want to preach and not use it. Yes. So that has become. I have created my own kind of small circle that you know is includes my purpose, my vision, my family, whatever beliefs, relationships. And you're right. You know who defines it's right. it's, it's each moment. Yeah. yeah. I know that you have a class starting at four, and you need to leave a little bit early to be able to be with your students on time. And I thank you with all this, you know, pressure time that you accepted my uh, invitation. In one minute, if there's anything we haven't talked about, and you really want our audience and viewers to know uh, about the concept of happiness and success, what would it be? Oh. <laughs> going it really I think I mentioned if I want to start I have to start so many things but I think it's like really uh, being present at this moment to um, what I what give uh, what uh, I have achieved now for example I'm really grateful even though you know I have to go to class but I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to share this my you know what I love with you being grateful with a new experience each moment. Beautiful. And at the end of the day, so I'm going to jot down, oh, that was a great experience. Having Actually, I have at four, I have examples for this. So they're stressed and I'm sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's for me, it's like a joy. Oh, yeah. I could do it in a, in a different, you know. Yeah. A new experience. I, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank uh, you. Dr. Amin, where can people find your uh, Amin Leadership uh, Center in Los Angeles? And if they wanted to show up and get your workshops or uh, any of the seminars or just find you and your books, where should they go? Okay. They can, uh, you know, email me, Amin Leadership 
up uh, at gmail.com. And so but my English version book is um, available at, at Amazon. But yes. the Farsi, I think maybe they can shoot me an email. I will uh, mail them. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being on the show. It was great. And um, I will let you go because I know you have to go and I will go over the seven uh, approach to success after you're gone for everybody. So we'll have the review for them. Thank you so much for being with us. So much, Pujan. I really appreciate it. Have a Same wonderful here. rest of And thanks, Sean, for checking everything and giving us this opportunity. So yes, yes, he's awesome. Two more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so everyone, um, I think that Dr. Amin has talked about uh, uh, seven steps and uh, that we're having your purpose, having your vision ready, having meaningful work, relationships that are uh, working for you and they really offer something to you uh, that you really can experience those. Um, and then you check your beliefs and behaviors that would work for you and would move you forward. Continue to review uh, yourself and everything that's going on. And then um, seven is having the discipline, having the discipline to work it through with all of that. Now, Sean, um, are you there? Beautiful. I know that we were talking about some of the concept. Did you uh, did you get anything out of that conversation based on how to reinvent and how to create and all of that for yourself or you know people you were asking about? Well, definitely an interesting conversation. I'll de you know I might even listen to it again just to grasp a little bit more of it. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. I think that we were started talking about gratitude at the beginning of the show. And I think that we kind of ended it also with the concept of having the gratitude in um, how much of the concept of gratitude makes us uh, go into a state of happiness versus the, you know, every time we look at lack and what we don't have, um, we go into the space of scarcity, fear, sadness. And the same moment, if we start looking at what we do have, we go back into content and happiness and, and, you know, the sense of success. And both are there. It's just to look at things we don't have and then create the vision and system in order to find it and get it and achieve it and so, so we can have it. But also to have the essence of what we do have uh, because those are our are, are strengths. Those are that was creates resiliency. That's what is there. And I think that in order to shift ourselves continuously into being happy and being committed, really being committed to the state of happiness makes us keep moving toward the concept of gratitude of what we have, feeling successful for who we are. Um, I think that it creates uh, lots of joy for us. So create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Until next week, bye-bye.